On the phone, ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure to welcome this next guest to our program. He is a writer with The Nation magazine, author of the wildly successful Herding Donkeys, <laughs> and uh, also the author of the forthcoming uh, book. What is your forthcoming book, Ari? Give us the ballot, the modern struggle for voting rights in America. Ladies and gentlemen, Ari Berman, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Ari, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and uh, one is your piece in, I think it's going to be in the June uh, Nation magazine, which is which is fascinating because everybody knows about the money primary, but uh, what I didn't know about was sort of the... Uh, the pers- th- there's another way to look at this, and I want to get to that in a moment. But before we do, there is a um, there is a case out there um, that the Supreme Court is now considering Evanwell versus Abbott. Tell us about this case and if this is going to have important implications on the right for people to vote in this country. Yeah. So the case, as you mentioned, is about how you calculate the drawing of districts. In this case, it's a challenge to state Senate districts in Texas. And ever since the one person, one vote rulings of the 1960s, the theory has been that you calculate population for districts based on the total population. So you include everybody who's in that district to to essentially calculate the total number of people and then decide representation that way. Now, the people that are challenging the state Senate districts in Texas, the same people who challenged the Voting Rights Act, I might add, they're saying, no, the way that you should calculate districts is only based on the eligible voters. So you shouldn't include children, you shouldn't include prisoners, you shouldn't include non-citizens, you should only include those people that are actually able uh, to cast a ballot. And that's very significant because basically you're saying that only people who can vote or who are eligible to vote deserve representation. And that ins- that will exclude a large segment of the population. So if if uh, the districts are drawn based only on eligible voters, what's going to happen is that districts that are drawn are going to be more rural, they're going to be more white, uh, and they're going to be more conservative. Because cities, by and large, are places where people who are you know, children, prisoners, non-citizens, etc., are more likely to live um, in cities, more likely to live in urban areas, more likely to live in liberal districts. So this is just another way that representation in America would become more conservative, and certain people would not have any representation whether or not they can or can't vote. And so I, I, I think what's sort of surprising about this to people is that this hasn't been resolved already. I mean, well, the, the, the reason I mean, it's, it's very surprising that the Supreme Court decided to take this case because everyone thought this was resolved. I right. mean, there really wasn't much of an issue here. I mean, one person, one vote has been established principle since 1964. Uh, people have not really been debating this issue that much. And so uh, for the court to take it, I mean, there's two theories about why they took it. One theory is that maybe um, the liberal justices agreed to take the case as a way to squash this issue once and for all, or potentially uh, it, it's possible that the conservative justices agreed to take this case. Remember, it only takes three justices to hear a case, but anyway, that they decided to hear it uh, essentially because this is going to be another decision that's going to radically shift voting rights to the right. I mean, you already had a situation where you know they gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013, a very radical decision, and now they're talking about one person, one vote, um, if they were to, to decide uh, that only eligible voters count for representation, that would be a dramatic, re- that would essentially mean a dramatic redrawing uh, of so many districts across the country. I mean, it would be a huge, huge deal. I got to tell you, uh, it seems unlikely to me that three liberal justices said like, oh, this is, the, the country has just been buzzing about this, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's wasting so much resources, let's clear the decks with this. It sounds to me like... Because, you know, people have to see this in the larger context, right, of this is a Supreme Court that, at least in all intents and purposes, uh, gutted the one of the key provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so 
this wouldn't be unprecedented for the Roberts Court to do this. It's absolutely true. The, the flip side of that is it only takes a Thomas, uh, a Scalia, and an Alito to hear the case. So, I mean, we just don't know. I mean, would Anthony Kennedy, who, who has positioned himself kind of on both sides of this issue, do something this radical? I mean, it's certainly possible he did vote to get the Voting Rights Act. Uh, at the same time, this seems to me that it's something that would be even more um, remarkable because remember in the Voting Rights Act case there was a lot of conservative opposition to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I argue that, that that position that opposition was misplaced but there was a long record here. In this case Texas is arguing on the same side as the federal government. So I mean you have a situation where even Texas which is one of the most rampant violators of voting the Voting Rights Act they don't even want these districts to change. So really the only person that's that's challenging this is this guy Ed Bloom uh, who launched the the case that challenged the Voting Rights Act and then uh, essentially is trying to challenge these districts. Uh, he knows they're protected under the Voting Rights Act, but he's trying to challenge them kind of through the back door. And so this was something, somewhat of an innovative case that he brought. Everyone thought it was a long shot, um, so it was surprising that the court decided to hear it. Is there going to be an oral argument to this case, or are we going to hear the, we're just, is one of those cases that we just, uh, we're going to hear the answer sometime, I don't know, in a month or so? No, I mean, I think there's going to be an oral argument. And what what about the practical implications of this? In other words, like, isn't, don't we determine, uh, don't we use the size of a, a congressional district in terms of resources in certain instances? Don't we, isn't this also sort of like how we use the census? Like, I mean, do we, I mean, this, there's going to be a lot of, it seems to me there's there's a lot of practical implications to this, aside from the fact that, we're going to have districts where um, there's no consciousness of anybody living there except for uh, voters. I, I mean, it's a very weird. Co- Before we get into the practicality, just talk about the concept of why one person, one vote, which we, we've never really questioned, is so important, right? I mean, because I well, could see some yeah. people saying, like, well, I mean, why should kids be counted? In terms of, like, in a congressional district, they just live there. Yeah, well, I mean, what, one person, one vote was so important because before you had that, you had districts that were wildly uneven. First off, you could have a district with 800,000 people in one district and 200,000 people in another. And But basically what happened was that under one person, one vote, you had these uh, large conservative rural areas that were disproportionately powerful, that they had way, way, way more power than anyone else because of uneven distribution uh, of, of the drawing of districts. And so when every district was drawing the same, that normalized things. That meant that, you know, urban areas had as much, if not more influence, obviously more influence because they had more people um, than these conservative rural areas. And, and so uh, a lot of people were denied representation because of the malapportionment that happened before one person, one vote. Uh, and so if, if you were then to uh, get rid of that, uh, then what you would essentially be doing is shifting power back to the people uh, that essentially don't have or don't deserve as much representation because there's just not as many people. Uh, and the other thing is just this basic concept of who deserves representation, right? Just because you can't vote, does that mean that you don't have needs? You shouldn't be looked after? Um, I mean, do, do children not count? Do non-citizens not count? Does a congressperson decide that I'm only going to look after the people that actually physically vote for me? I mean, in, in that case, that would dramatically narrow the whole concept of representation in this country and, and who deserves to be looked after. Right. And we should make it clear, this isn't a situation of un, undocumented uh, immigrants. This is just this people who are legal uh, res, uh, residents also not counted uh, as opposed to just citizens. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right. So, uh, from a practical standpoint, big implications in terms of the census and like uh, apportioning uh, census. I mean, um, resources. Yeah, I mean, it is a big issue. I mean, there, there's already concern that the census is undercounting people, and then you, if you if you don't include the census, if you do it some other way, uh, it, there's just going to be even more questions about the data we're using. I mean, no one believes that there's any real practical way to do this. Um, So I I think that this would be a very unworkable um, situation if the Supreme Court wasn't going to decide it this way. All right. Well, uh, I guess we will will find out 
We don't have to have too much suspense, right? Because we'll find out within uh, six weeks, it seems to me. Is that usually how it works, right? No, I mean, I, I think that the case is slated. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the case is slated um, for oral arguments. And so I think this is going to be a, a long process. Oh, really? But don't, do, isn't the term over in this? Is it, are, aren't they considering it this term? I don't know. I have to look back at it okay. because you're, this is too much detail, Sam. Okay? I understand. I'm All sorry, tough buddy. Questions. I know. I know. You're used to a little bit. You're a little, a little bit used to a little bit more, a little less detail on that. Yeah, usually I can just slack through. I know you've things. got other things to do other than to check the uh, Supreme Court schedule. But be that as it may, it, one of those things it was uh, you're writing this piece for The Nation magazine, and um, you outline. And this is pretty amazing because as I was reading your piece, I mean, I think this audience is fairly um, well informed about just how much money we're talking about and, and how much the sort of the gloves have come off after um, after both um, uh, the McCutcheon case and the uh, Citizens United case. But it, it's interesting to me because I was just thinking, you know, we've seen all these reports coming out of Iowa where Bernie Sanders is getting massive crowds for Iowa. I mean, massive crowds, like crowds that are larger than the towns he's showing up in and uh, huge, as he would say, bigger than what Dean was getting is my understanding at this time. And this is a guy who came out of nowhere. But there's still this sort of sense of like, well, that's great, but Bernie doesn't have the money that Hillary has. So it's it's completely written off. And um, th- that creates an interesting dynamic. Just set it up uh, for us, because before we get to this part about how uh, people are starting to theorize that this undermines voting rights. Yeah, well, I mean, the money has just become so determinative at every stage of the political process. I mean, the money decides not just on the presidential level, but on the congressional level and, and all the way down. I mean, the amount of money you can raise decides um, who gets to run it decides uh, who the media takes seriously which is your point about bernie sanders it decides which issues are prioritized it decides ninety percent of the time who actually wins um, and so at every stage of the process there's what is known as this wealth primary and the wealth primary uh... is a factor at every stage of the process so it's a factor in terms of who's running for office who's being taken seriously, who is winning, and uh, which issues are getting prioritized, and which donors are getting prioritized. And this is just a a uh, phenomenon that's getting worse and worse and worse, and particularly in the wake of Citizens United, it's just exploded uh, to the point where um, there's so much money in the system uh, that there's really no checks uh, to, to try to, you know, in, in any sort of feasible way, control the influence of it. And we should say, obviously, this is this is Republican and Democrats. I mean, you you outline. I would love to see someone make a graphic of the billionaires that support each one of the candidates, um, because I feel like there's a couple of um, couple of people I don't know who are, are uh, aligning with with, um, or I don't know who's align which billionaires are aligning with every one of those candidates. Now, to be you know uh, to cut myself some slack, there's a lot of candidates out there now. <laughs> Um, but I mean, so you, you've outlined the a tremendous amount of money and what do we, I mean, we're looking at a billion dollars, right. On, on both sides, a couple of billion dollars, right? Oh, easily. I mean, we're, we're looking at, I mean, the Koch brothers alone are going to spend almost a billion dollars. Um, the Clinton campaign is going to spend a billion dollars. Uh, the Republican primary, I mean, you could get multiple billion dollars. I think everyone expects that this election is going to cost like you know, seven to eight billion dollars when it's all said and done. That's just stunning. And we can't really know these days exactly what the numbers are, right? Because we're starting to see this development where the candidates are outsourcing a lot of their work to these super PACs. Uh, and uh, the super PACs have a lot less uh, uh, disclosure requirements. And so they're going to be running sort of these parallel campaigns. 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, well, they're already running parallel campaigns. I mean, Jeb Bush hasn't even announced for president, and yet he's going around raising money for his super PAC, and his super PAC is doing all the things a traditional uh, candidacy would do. I mean, you have a situation where recently uh, Foster Freeze, who was Rick Santorum's biggest donor in 2012, basically said, if I give the money, I'm going to give it secretly. <laughs> so it's like, you're not even going to know if I gave it. And, and what a, I mean, what a brazen thing to essentially say uh, that, you know, and, and what he's doing is not illegal. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's really no penalties for what he's doing. I mean, he can basically say, you know, I'm going to give all this money and you won't know about it. Um, but yet somehow we feel that we're living in a democracy when this kind of stuff goes on, where a billionaire can give as much money he wants with no disclosure, and that's somehow uh, compatible with a democratic system. All right, so let's talk about this in the context of the, the Voting Rights Act, because um, the... The, there is an intersection here in these issues that I don't think is necessarily um, intuitive, or at least it wasn't until, um, uh, you know, you, you started to tease it out in this. I mean, start to talk about, like, how, how that's the case, how, how the uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act may intersect with this issue. Sure. So, I mean, let me just lay out first the, the kind of broad argument, which is the broad argument is that, you know, when the wealthy have so much power in the political system, their vote matters more than everyone else. So that's the basic argument of the piece, that the wealth priming in American politics is undermining the value of the vote, not the right to vote, the value of the vote for basically everyone who's not a billionaire. Now, the second thing you look at is, is there... Um, now, wait a, a second, wait a second. I don't want, I don't, I, don't, I, I, I really want to walk through that. Why is that the case, right? Everybody can still go walk into the, the, to the ballot box and vote. So why is that the case? Well, let's just let's just look at the end game here. Everyone can vote, but is but first off, we, we, we already talked about the fact that, you know, you have to have money to run for office. You have to have money to win office. So already there there's a narrowing down effect. But most importantly, what happens once someone's elected? Which issues are prioritized? And I think that's really where we see the wealth primary in action, because there's this huge disparity um, between the rich and everybody else when it comes to policy preferences. There's been research on this, for example. 68% of the public thinks that you know the government should make it sure that everyone who wants to work can find a job. So 68% of the public believe that, but only 19% of the wealthy agree. And there's been extensive research by these political scientists, um, uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, Gillens from Princeton and Page from Northwestern. And they've basically found um, that when the wealthy want a policy to happen, it becomes law. And when the public wants a policy to ha happen, it doesn't become law. Unless, unless, the, wealthy, unless, they, unless they, the wealthy also want right. it to happen. And that basically means that the wealthy determine virtually every policy that happens in American politics when it comes to the economy. Um, their, their exact words is, quote-unquote, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent and an influence. In the United States, the majority, quote unquote, does not rule, at least in the casual sense of actually determining policy outcomes. That means that the public can vote for a candidate who supports raising the minimum wage. But if the wealthiest Americans aren't for the minimum wage, the likelihood of it becoming law is so much less than it otherwise would have been. And that's why I argue that the the billionaires have such a, a greater value of their vote than everyone else does. I mean, and, and we've had Gillens. People can uh, can search uh, the site and find uh, we interviewed uh, Gillens on this. But it, uh, so the I want to figure out, though, how we make this jump. And it seems to me like you, you quote the um, uh, free speech for people, I guess which has been exploring whether the wealth primary violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits a voting system in which the totality of circumstances leads to minority voters having less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process and elect candidates of their choice. So the totality of the circumstances, at the very least, broadens it out from just your ability to walk into the booth, right, and pull a, la a lever. Right. Because yeah. the, the, because it has to do with like what candidates are available, how easy it is for you to vote, uh, whether or not your vote is 
as valuable as someone else's vote. In other words, um, you know, if you're if you're electing a, a congressperson and uh, the uh, I guess there's there's a smaller number of people in there, your vote is worth worth more. Then the question is whether they have less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process and elect candidates of their choice. I guess the question is is like if the wealthy are part of the electro- electorate and they have more opportunity to participate in the political process and more opportunity to elect candidates of their choice, that's, that seems to be the rub. Is that where, the, where we're talking about? Well, uh, the, in terms of the Voting Rights Act, the violation would essentially be, you know, if, if people of color are, are essentially disadvantaged, disadvantaged in this wealth primary, and the facts are that they are. I mean, you look at, you know, uh, people of color are 37 percent of the U.S. population, but only one percent of campaign c- contributors and 10 percent of elected officials. And so you, you have a, a situation where um, they're at a serious marked disadvantage uh, in the wealth primary. They, they, con- they control fewer resources um, and they're, they're further down on the socioeconomic scale. And, and, and that's why, you know, I quote a, a, a study by George Washington University Law Professor uh, Spencer Overton, where he says, a political process based on private money gives wealthier white communities disproportionately large influence in determining all candidates. And so then you look at the, at the at Section 2 of the VRA, and Section 2 of the VRA has nine factors that courts are supposed to consider uh, when, they, when they're deciding if uh, a a voting system or a voting district is discriminatory, and two of them specifically relate uh, to the wealth primary. One, um, whether the effects of past discrimination uh, in, in things like education, employment, um, hinder their ability to participate in the political process, which courts have found has been the case, and also the exclusion of members. And this is this says from the candidate slating process. Now, no one is officially excluded by the wealth primary, but certainly uh, in in means uh, in terms of people not having access to money, not having access to donors, uh, they are excluded. And it's true that people of color are more likely to be excluded because they have less money um, when they're running for office. And so uh, this is not to say that this would be a slam dunk case. I mean, I think this would be a very, very tough case to win, particularly under the current judiciary. Well, it's the under the current court. judiciary, forget about it, right? I mean, when I we mean, talk the about this. Court, right. The Roberts Court, the two things they hate the most are voting rights and the regulation of money in politics. So this would be like the ultimate twofer for John Roberts. He'd practically explode if this case reached the Supreme Court. But I, I, I wrote this to get people thinking about the issue, um, that, that, that maybe the, the amount of money in the political system, maybe it's not only morally wrong, maybe it's also legally wrong, too. And, and we should start thinking about this. And we should start thinking about it in terms of all Americans, but we should also start thinking about it in terms of the Voting Rights Act, because that's an actual piece of legislation that you can litigate under, um, as opposed to the, the whole concept of getting money out of politics, which is basically totally legally unworkable right now with the current Supreme Court. I mean, people should understand this. I mean, it's because there has been uh, attempts to to institute some type of campaign finance. That's been rolled back both sort of, I guess, uh, not so much statutorily, uh, but uh, by the Supreme Court in its decisions. And we're talking about five, ten years out, maybe, you know, well, five years is not unrealistic, where we could be looking at a completely different Supreme Court. I mean, by completely different, I mean one where it could very well be 5-4 in favor of um, more center-left than center-right, than, you know, from the center to the right. And, you know, because all it takes is you've got two Supreme Court justices uh, on the conservative block who are in their, at least deep into their 70s. Uh, mid 70s, uh, two of those people get replaced, and suddenly it's five three, or I should say uh, five four, and so this is how this happens, right? These these ideas. So I mean, are there are there groups out there that are beginning to sort of think about this and develop this and starting to look for test cases? Because we should tell people that the first case we talk about, uh, one person, one vote, is brought up by a think tank essentially. Couple of couple of guys who get go out and get money to just to bring cases like this, except for to disenfranchise people from voting. Yeah, I mean, I I think 
you know, two things will happen. Number one, if the Supreme Court changes, I think people will try to bring a challenge that gets the court to re-examine Citizens United. And so maybe that will be a more straightforward uh, campaign finance case, because certainly four justices are very unhappy about Citizens United. And if there was a President Clinton was to name, a second President Clinton (laughs) was to name a a Supreme Court justice. Hillary has already said that one of her litmus tests for a Supreme Court justice is whether they will uh, look to overturn Citizens United. So that's already an issue that despite all the money that she's raising, that that she's identified as something that she cares about. And so I think whoever she appointed would... would certainly want to relook at that decision. Um, the second thing is is trying to restore protections for voting rights because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Voting Rights Act was gutted, and so I certainly think you're going to try to get cases up there um, that it gets the court to to look at, uh, in the absence of a congressional solution, more protections for voting rights. And this could be an issue potentially where there could be overlap um, between uh, the the campaign finance world and the voting rights world, and it would be a, it would be an innovative case. Um, it, it would be something that I, I think would uh, not be the traditional case that the court would heard, but the conservatives have been bringing crazy cases for years uh, and, and trying to get the court to hear them, and they've succeeded by doing that. And this is just an attempt to try to get uh, progressives to start thinking the same way out of the box, a little bit more creatively about how to restore protections uh, to a system that has gone completely out of control. You mentioned um, uh, in your piece uh, Lawrence Lessig uh, drawing parallels between the fight for voting rights in 1960 and the push to get money out of politics today. How much is he doing in 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 terms of 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 sort of trying to develop these theories? Because you know people should know that like, the the for a lot of people this is sort of the um, uh, and not so much the silver bullet, but this is this is. This is the first thing that we have to fight and to figure out. And it's very difficult because it seems like just about all roads are barred in some respect. A, a and B, it also seems like the public at large does not is not energized by this issue. Yeah, well, I think, you know, Lessig hasn't been looking so much at the litigation, even though he is a law professor. Uh, I think he's been looking more at the, the, what you just mentioned. Number one is mobilizing public opinion to get people to really care about the issue. And number two, I think he, he's trying to push for legislative solutions. And so uh, w- one of the things he did in the last election was try to elect candidates uh, who were more amenable to getting money out of politics. Now, that, that effort largely failed in 2014 because there was such a conservative wave election. Um, but going forward, I mean, I think number one, he's going to he's, he's going to try to elect um, more progressive candidates on this issue. And then I also think there's a number of good pieces of legislation that would, uh, you know, incentivize small donors. So it wouldn't ban rich donors, but it would just basically, uh, through public matching funds and other means, um, give right small donors more of a value for their vote. Because right now, there's no real reason for a candidate to try to get a $5 donation if they can get a $5 million donation. I mean, why would you? But if you get a $5 donation and that's matched so that you get a bunch more $5 donations and there's actually an incentive to do so, then maybe candidates, not on the presidential level so much, but certainly for Congress and other races, would actually decide uh, to look at, at smaller donor donations. And, and, and actually, if you look at, for example, de Blasio in New York, uh, he was elected because because of, in large part, because he was able to run because of a public matching system. Um, and, and so that, that allows more progressive candidates to get elected. And so that's something that's being looked at in Congress. But, I mean, right now, any sort of congressional solution is really a Band-Aid uh, on, a, on a completely broken system. Wow. All right. Well, uh, so, Ari, are you going to be, um, uh, before you go, are you going to you gonna head on the campaign trail uh, this year or no? We'll see. I have a book to promote starting in August, so I'll be on my own campaign trail then, uh, and and then probably eventually I'll be on the actual campaign trail at some point. What do you make out of, I mean, I should just uh, to give people some backstory, uh, Ari still owes me, as far as I can tell, hundreds of dollars worth of dinners uh, for <laughs> from ranging back one, from like 2007. One, uh, one dinner, okay, one dinner. Well, but it, I think it was worth like hundreds of dollars. Um 
Because it was uh, worth like two hundred dollars, and I think you waived the fee eventually. I may have waived the fee. Just and there because, may have been a statute of limitations on that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as a but uh, not in you talking about it, because certainly in like thirty five years, you're still going to be like we're going to be like sitting around playing bingo, and you're still going to be talking about like the money that you won for me in two thousand eight. I there are, there are times just over the course of the day where I just yell <laughs> bingo and say, and people say, "What are you talking about?" And I go, "Well, I beat Ari in that bet. I had that bet with Ari in two thousand seven. Uh, when we bet as before, I think President Obama was even the nominee. I think I got the uh, I bet the percentage he was going to beat the Republican by. So wh- which which horse are you riding today? Which horse am I riding today? Well, I think the I think the the Democrat is going to beat the Republican, I would say. And I think it's going to be probably anywhere from three to four percentage points. Mm-hmm. And who, who are you predicting for the Republicans? <sighs> That's tricky, but I, but I, I tend to go. I'm tending to lean towards Scott Walker. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think that's um, it's conceivable, um, you know, Bush or Rubio, but I tend to think it's going to be Scott Walker. I, I don't think my one prediction is I don't think we're going to get a Clinton Bush election. Wow. So are you saying possibly Bush Sanders? Yes, I'm saying Bush Sanders. <laughs> How'd you know? I don't think I don't think uh, Jeb Bush is uh, is go- is going to make the long haul either. No, no, I definitely don't think he's going to make the long haul. I think Walker or Rubio are the most likely. Too. Yeah. Uh, well, we're in agreement, so I guess I will not be. Uh... We're going to have to have something to bet on sooner or later, though. Yeah, exactly. But it it sounds like we're going to have to go to a kid friendly place now. <laughs> We can we can we can bet over popsicles at Kidville. All right, uh, we'll work on that. Ari Berman, always a pleasure. We will link to your piece how the money primary is undermining voting rights at uh, Majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks a lot, Sam. Good to talk to you.